Mayuri Dhumal is a data values advocate from India. Her talk is called 51%. Where are the women in the data discourse? Hello. I want you all to come with me to the small village of Nashik where I met Tulsa last year. And uh, Tulsa was drenched in water because it was raining and she was fetching water on a well while I was uh, passing by the road. But I stopped and I went to talk to her and she said that she left her school at seventh grade and just because there was nobody at her home to fill water. This year, when I went back to the same village again, I was finding out Tulsa, but nobody was aware about her. Nobody was talking about her, but some small girl was around there and she recognized her name and she told me that Tulsa was married off in last May. So I want you all to think about the connection between scarcity of water and the early marriages and the dropout of education. We want to think about how climate change is affecting women and how it is affecting their whole lives and not just physical or mental health, but the even start of their life. They are dropping out of school. They are getting married off and there is no future in front of their eyes. I have been working with the tribal girls and young women in India uh, since past three years. Uh, so basically, I did my literature in feminist theory and there I realized that uh, most of the feminist narratives are not recorded in the uh, past and they need to be uh, came to the light. And that uh, during covid uh, I got a chance to work on a research project which led me to do to understand action research. We need to uh, talk about gendered lenses of data, but for that we need to make sure that processes or the systems are in place. My appeal to the philanthropist, the funding community, public sector and private sector is that please ensure that knowledge is accessible and available for all the communities, all the marginalized people in their own languages so that they are able to be a part of data processes and systems and they own their data. And this will make the data more inclusive and this will help us achieve the goals we want to. Most of the data are academically written or they have third eye perspectives, but not the real grassroots perspectives from the people who, are, who have experienced the real impact of issues uh, that can be a poverty or hunger or even climate change. No first person narratives were there. We need these perspectives to make a real change. Otherwise, we have numbers. Uh, we say that girls are getting educated. Uh, we have got like 100% tap water connections. But in reality, those, those connections are not worth. They don't get real water to their taps. And they have to walk to the wells like 2 to 3 kilometers from their houses daily. Though they have a just infrastructure of the taps and pipelines at their home. So if infrastructure or the number of taps is the indicator of development, then that's not real. So as a data value advocate, we are advocating for uh, five data values, uh, out of which democratization of data skills, funding for uh, this democratization of data, and helping people to understand data, make ensuring that they uh, have knowledge of transparency in data, are some goals which I am like uh, interested in and I'm working for that because we have people who don't own the data, who don't have power to work on data, they are being fooled. So if we work on more data democratization, we work on the data skills, we advocate for that, that will help people to liberate. That will, because I have seen people taking action as soon as they know that they are being fooled. And that's the power of knowledge. Richard Moraya is the founder of the Demography Project based in Kenya. His talk is called Human Right and Climate Wrong. 
a move towards a net zero solution to data. Greetings from Kenya. Uh, my name is Richard Moraya. I'm a citizen scientist, a data journalist, uh, focusing on environmental issues. And I pride myself in uh, engaging with local communities to build their resilience in the wake of uh, the ongoing climate crisis. I'm the founder of a community-based organization in Kenya called the Demography Project. And uh, what we do is that we leverage citizen science, uh, data science itself, as well as grassroots journalism to enhance local communities' uh, voices and amplify them towards building resilience in the wake of, again, the global climate crisis, as well as other issues uh, pertaining to sustainable development. We've just come from the worst drought in our country's history, and 3.5 million Kenyans were affected by the drought itself. And this event, these extreme climate events will be recurring in the future. And what we wanted to do is that we wanted citizens to take charge of the data that they are generating and take action with regards to how best we can respond to extreme climate events. Uh, through this, we are um, installing um, modern and compact uh, weather stations across the local communities most affected by climate change so that they can adequately respond to uh, excessive UV uh, exposure uh, during the day. We are looking at uh, how best farmers can be able to correlate uh, rainfall, humidity, data, and plan around their um, agricultural cycles so that they can be able to uh, mitigate uh, excessive losses due to extreme climate events. Uh, secondly, what we are currently doing is that we are installing air quality monitors in local communities most affected by poor air quality. Data uh, can show that this is one of the leading causes of deaths in Kenya, that uh, prolonged exposure to vehicular emissions, as well as over-reliance on um, charcoal, amongst other biomass uh, kind of uh, sources of uh, domestic energy. These are causing a lot of uh, uh, respiratory issues amongst communities. So we are using uh, low-cost devices to enable uh, households and communities record this kind of data and see remedial measures that they can to, they can take to ensure that they have the best or uh, the best remedial measures to mitigate health issues surrounding uh, the uh, ongoing climate issue. I believe that everyone has a role to play, whether with formal or informal skills. That is why I work very closely with very underserved communities who previously have not had this opportunity to engage in issues that affect not just they themselves, but the world at large. Without having the ownership of the data uh, source itself and the data owners, it is impossible to design innovations and interventions to improve their lives. We need to remember that communities, and by when I say communities, we're talking about Households, we are talking about families, we are talking about individual lives who all matter. And we need to understand that they are not just statistics, they are not just digits, they are not just numbers. We are talking about individuals who need to have their voices, voices factored in in any kind of development on data issues across the world. Young data change makers in Kenya should anchor their interventions on one thing, community, community, and community. Amna Abdulatif is the co-founder of the three hijabis based in the UK. Her talk is called, Our Hijabs Will Not Keep Us Out of Football, a data discussion on race. My name is uh, Amna Abdulatif. I am one third of the three hijabis. Um, the three hijabis essentially um, kick started during the men's Euros in 2021 with a viral tweet uh, that read something like the three hijabis walked into a bar to watch the three lions uh, thrash Ukraine. This kind of started this interest, I guess, in seeing women who aren't normally seen uh, talking about football or supporting football or being passionate about the game in the final game 
game where we lost uh, to Italy in penalties, what we saw was this mass of racist abuse towards those three young black players, but also racism being experienced by many people of colour across the United Kingdom. What we decided to do was, um, because we'd had a bit of a platform and there was this media interest in us, we decided to build a petition calling for the banning of racists from football. In 48 hours, we had over a million people sign um, the petition um, calling on the government to act uh, to extend banning orders, uh, but also asking the Football Federation um, to also think about their role in supporting their players, but also in protecting and supporting fans. What we did, and alongside those, you know, 1.2 million people who joined us, was really rewrite that narrative, that it was no longer about the racist. It was about those people that had hope, that had wanted a country and um, that was you know, based around equality and justice, uh, they were the story, they became the story. And so it kind of really reframed, actually, the focus of the media narrative. One of the things that I'm really proud of is actually some of the campaigning work we've done since the um, anti-racism work, um, which has been around misogyny and talking about violence against women and girls within uh, football and seeing some of the change that's happened from that. So we saw the Premier League, for instance, implement mandatory consent training for all of their clubs. The number of uh, girls who see that there is a, a career and a potential in football, the number of women who are accessing it for ledger, um, to see, you know, who've been told many, many years or, you know, that football's for boys, it's not for girls, it's not for us, um, actually now kind of, you know, taking football as a means to um, uh, enjoy themselves, to get fitter, to, you know, to reclaim back some of that narrative around um, that football wasn't meant for us. I think sometimes Sometimes what data shows us is a problem, right? You know, we're collecting the data around the number of racist incidents that happen. We're collecting the data around, you know, whether women feel safe or unsafe, you know, in the in the, in the football stadium. But we're not collecting data necessarily to show actually what that change has been, you know. And and that's something that I'd be, you know, really kind of pushing for is that positive story, I guess, of what has changed and how we do that. And I think as change makers, sometimes we get lost in the problem the data and, and the problem that it sets out, but not necessarily um, in actually some of those changes that we know about, but we don't necessarily have the data to kind of um, share um, on this. I have a real belief in the goodness of people, um, in our abilities to create really transformational change. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I truly believe that. I, I think all of us have a role to play. Um, and I hope that, you know, I'm doing my part as much as I can um, but I also want to bring other people in on the journey with us because I do believe that everyone has a role to play um, in, in creating a society and a world that's better for everyone.